welcome to the second morning session of our conference. So while people are taking their seats and beginning to sit down, let me first quickly introduce myself. I'm Sheila Jasanoff, and I'm a professor at the John F. Kennedy School of Government here at Harvard, and I direct the program on science, technology, and society there. And I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker of this session, who's Martin Malozzi. He's the Hugh Roy and Lily Krantz Cullen University Professor of History and the Executive Director of the Center for Public History at the University of Houston. He's an extraordinarily prolific and widely published author uh, whose work has taken him from Houston to Helsinki and Helsinki to Shanghai. Uh, he's written uh, many, many books of which um, the, one of the more recent is Precious Commodity, Providing Water for America's Cities. And in 2005, for his contributions to research and teaching at the University of Houston, he won the Esther Farfel Award, which is the highest honor accorded to University of Houston faculty. And Professor Malosi will be presenting a talk entitled, as you see, Water is Not the New Oil. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers of the uh, meeting. It's been very stimulating so far, and I hope I can continue that trend uh, uh, this, uh, this morning. Uh, my talk uh, comes from uh, the uh, Monty Python School of uh, Research, which is now for something completely different. Uh, I, I, I'm broadening the discussion a little bit uh, to uh, at least tentatively move away from more technical and scientific issues to those that I think relate somewhat to policy. And posing a question by using what has been uh, kind of a common journalistic uh, uh, title, that water is not the new oil, or water is the new oil, I should say. Uh, in my case, I think that that uh, term, that idea, is highly simplified. And it allows me to kind of get into the question of what seems to be the important issue or issues that we need to consider when we're looking at the development of water policy. Um, I think the essential difference in, in answering this question very briefly is that if we look at the, the historic role of water, it extends over generations and centuries well beyond the area of fossil fuels and I think in, in respect to longevity alone becomes uh, an issue quite distinct from the uh, current set of concerns we have about uh, peak oil and so forth. Uh, and in many ways, I think the, the better way to phrase it is that water is the new water, and that, that we have rediscovered issues that have led us to believe that there is a, a freshwater crisis, which on many levels is an accurate assessment, but doesn't tell the whole story. And I'd like to discuss that a little bit more fully. Certainly there are comparisons, uh, certainly the, the debates in recent years about peak oil and having passed peak oil and looking toward alternatives for our, our energy sources either because of shortages or environmental implications or, or geopolitical questions, uh, certainly compares somewhat favorably with ideas about the availability of water and the degree to which this resource uh, is, is precious and often scarce and therefore uh, can uh, become uh, a very, very uh, central feature of conflict into the 21st century. Um, I, I know several years ago I, I moderated a session between Israelis and Palestinians over boundary issues related to water, and believe me, I felt like I should have had a striped shirt on that day and holding uh, participants back. These are intensely serious issues, uh, and I, I fully realize that. But I do think in the case of water, some of the questions are uh, somewhat different. Uh, I'm going to kind of touch upon a few of these points, and most of what I have on the PowerPoint is really a wallpaper more than it is kind of substantive information. So uh, you might want to just keep that in mind, and I'll talk about each of these subjects a little bit. There is a certain kind of nostalgia about water, uh, certainly in, in how we used to get it. Uh, in this case, water peddlers this is in the United States. Uh, from Chicago, uh, Lake Michigan, uh, very gender-oriented, where women uh, 
carried the load literally on bringing water back to the home, wells and so forth. Uh, there has been a, a persistent concern about the correlation between health and water, an important one, a necessary one, uh, and one we've learned much more about in, in recent years, and the complexity of the technology in delivering uh, uh, water. It speaks to the physical characteristics of water. It speaks to the complexity of going from source to delivery. Uh, I first want to make a, a few very brief remarks about consumption and demand, and this is a fairly kind of typical uh, slide that indicates the kind of correlation between population growth and water in more recent years since 1940. Uh, and if we look at the, the history of consumption over the last hundred years, uh, we found that world population has about tripled uh, while water withdrawals have uh, increased something like six times. And so even this, uh, this graphic doesn't really uh, display the, uh, the, the drama of that statistic. Uh, water use has been growing twice the rate of population increases in the last century. And population upsurge, certainly in itself, explains a great deal about, uh, about increases in fresh water use, but it's not the whole story. It's too simple a correlation. It's too simple a correlation for any discussion of a, of a, a resource, in this case, water. Uh, the types of uses that water is put is also significant. We've heard a little bit about that already. Uh, when we think about irrigation, and on a world, worldwide scale, we're talking about a, approximately 70 percent of fresh water used to irrigate in one form or another. It's a staggering statistic because it indicates that uh, here is where uh, major policy concerns uh, have to be addressed. Uh, however, we, we think also, and, and maybe oftentimes more often about the industrial uses of water worldwide, which represents about a quarter, 22 percent of, of water use in contemporary times, and only about 8 percent of water is used for domestic purposes. And so in establishing water policy, I think you have to keep in mind how water is used, which correlates with the number of people that are using it and certainly uh, questions of geography. So these are, these are the complexities in designing policy that in some cases have been addressed, oftentimes have been overlooked. Water withdrawal in the 20th century increased you know, enormously, as, as I've suggested in the, in, the, in the previous centuries. In more recent times, uh, we have seen, in some cases, a stabilization of water use, especially in uh, developed countries, mostly in North America and Western Europe. And so there is not a, an equal uh, set of, of uh, specific problems that go across the globe uh, in ways that we can generalize policy. It's certainly water issues, uh, like a lot of resources, are site-specific, and, and as a result, uh, we have to take a local, regional, national uh, uh, considerations uh, in line with our with our policy. Uh, certainly uh, today when we think about uh, the concentration of use, we think about Asia uh, it remains uh, hands down uh, the, the biggest uh, consumer in the late 20th century uh, with withdrawals greater than uh, on all other continents combined. And so the Asian issue is, is particularly significant. This is uh, due in, in, in large uh, measure certainly to population, but also uh, in terms of the availability of water. Uh, one third of uh, the world's uh, stream flow is in Asia. So we have a, a, a gigantic uh, percentage of fresh water located in Asia, but at the same time, tremendous pressure uh, to use it. Limits on supply and scarcity uh, are really the uh, uh, the major topic of conversation we've seen in the last uh, few uh, decades, and concern about scarcity, concern about availability of water, uh, and this sometimes is presented in such grossly general terms that it's meaningless, and other times it is important as kind of a call to arms uh, to try to seek some kind of solution. So getting that kind of balance is always uh, somewhat difficult. I mean, only uh, about 2.5% uh, the world's total volume of water is uh, fresh water, and most of that is in, or has been, in, uh, in ice and in, uh, in permanent snow cover. Uh, there's uh, uh, other water comes from groundwater, of course, from the atmosphere, uh, 
and only less than 1%, in fact, about 0.3% of uh, our water comes from uh, uh, lakes and, uh, and, and rivers. And so we're drawing uh, on kind of limited uh, resources uh, to get a limited resource, and this only tends to compound the problem. But when we start talking about scarcity, you know, what scale are we talking? And it's important for us to understand when we're having these discussions, what do we mean? Are we running out of riverine water? Are we, are we depleting lakes? Uh, are we uh, getting access to other sources of water that hadn't been used historically? And so terminology is very important. It's not simply a way of, of, of clearly stating issues, but also addressing issues. And so in the questions of limited uh, supply and scarcity, uh, knowing where the water is and how accessible it is is important. And here is a diversion or a distinction from oil. Uh, yes, we, we can see scarcities in both resources, but we look about, if you look at on, on growth statistics, uh, our availability of water is much, much greater than our availability of oil. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't problems that exist uh, for both natural resources, but they are distinctive. They are different. Uh, their location is different. The geography and geology related to water is different. Uh, so I'm really trying to uh, muddy the waters a bit. This is what historians do, is to try to make complex what appears to be simple. And uh, we're really good at that. That's why our books don't sell very much, but that's uh, certainly what we do. Uh, uh, we, we do see scarcity uh, throughout the world, and, and they are uh, uh, significant and localized. In 1904, according to one source, there were uh, 31 countries mostly in Africa and the Near East, uh, that were facing water stresses, especially uh, in, in agriculture. Uh, 17 additional countries uh, with a population of over 2 billion people were uh, that were water poor. Middle East has certainly has had a range of, of problems historically. Uh, but if we look in terms of volume available, again, we're not getting the whole answer because part of that volume, depending where you are, is unusable. It's not potable, it's been polluted, uh, or it, it is inaccessible. And so a bigger question in some respects is how do we measure what is available and to what degree uh, can we determine how much of that available water ultimately can be used in the long run and what can be used uh, most immediately. Uh, certainly one of the most striking statistics of, of, of the last several years is looking at the number of people uh, throughout the world that have inadequate or uh, uneven access to clean water. And those statistics range from the 860 million range uh, in excess of, of 1 billion. And these are, are parallel issues. They're not the same issue uh, because in this case we're talking about severe sanitation problems that uh, uh, de deal with, uh, with health problems uh, that uh, are uh, in their own way unique and significant. So we have a range of, of issues that uh, fall within the purview of our examination of limited supply and scarcity. Uh, and another thing that's, that's uh, uh, quite interesting is how we measure scarcity, how we determine it. Uh, for example, in Israel, uh, which has only uh, about 300 uh, uh, square meters uh, per capita per year of, of available water for its citizens versus the United States and Canada, where that figure is something like 693 square meters per person, uh, we would infer from that that Israel faces much more severe problems with respect to available water for use. But we have to take into consideration how Israelis use their water, how they are, uh, are applying its uses, uh, not simply in these gross terms, because in reality, uh, in some cases, we, we can't look at Israel as being in a position that is uh, inferior to the United States in terms of available water. Uh, this is not to say there are not problems there, not significant problems, but we have to look at how water is being used, how efficiently it's being used, and what measures of stress individual countries place on their available supplies. All these things, I think, require a, a depth of analysis in order to, uh, to refine how we utilize these kinds of terms. Um, what is missing, I think, and this is something that's been interesting to, uh, interesting to me and what I've written about to some degree, is 
um, the question of political will when it comes to making hard decisions in terms of water allocation and use. And in many, uh, many ways, I think where the issue begins to narrow is at that point. And that is where governments, where those in power, where private corporations make the decisions, how they make the decisions, how water is allocated, who gets it, who doesn't. And uh, even in terms of the kinds of technologies that are available and applied, the decision makers, whether they're knowledgeable or not, whether they have constituencies that they're trying to serve uh, for one purpose or another, make the decisions on how these things are utilized. And so for us to diminish in some way or not to consider kind of the human element in the story is not to understand very, very effectively what a crisis might end up being. And the complexity here, of course, is that, uh, that uh, uh, the issues of power uh, change from place to place and from time to time. And here is just uh, not, not a very good graph, but it kind of gives a kind of a, a broad suggestion of uh, world water availability. Uh, here it really talks about uh, problems of safe drinking water. And if you even just look at the, the red areas, you can see uh, the high concentration of, of unsafe drinking water in, uh, in, in much of Africa and also distributed in Asia and, and uh, parts of Latin America. And again, these kind of coincide with uh, kind of uh, uh, d problems of, of, of developing countries. This is not a particularly good, uh, easily viewed slide, but it talks about scarcities. And uh, if we, we look at uh, those places that are not green on this chart, that this correlates uh, very closely with the, the problems of safe drinking water. So you have a kind of a double whammy here. On the one hand, you have uh, real problems of scarcity, and you also have problems of, of safe, safe water. Who controls water? I don't have time really to talk about, uh, about this at any, at any length, uh, other than to make a few generalizations. And I think this is important in terms of allocation, why things are allocated, why resources are allocated, and to whom, and who controls those decisions. Uh, the allocation is one of those issues that speaks not only to, to economics, which is often couched in, but in, into power. Uh, water, controlling water, is having power. Making a decision on who gets it is power. And it translates into kind of political control. And as a result, I think that's a, a, an issue that may be a little understudied and, and certainly has to be factored into to any understanding of, of how uh, we utilize this resource. Uh, to to uh, what uses water is placed, as I mentioned, uh, who controls the access to the water, and the, the quality of the available water, all of these things come together uh, to uh, make decisions over water use complicated. So in some respects, the, these are more qualitative questions than they are quantitative in, in trying to uh, unravel uh, the serious issues at hand. Um, geographer Eric Swindenu, who's written about water throughout the world, Latin America and Europe, uh, has written about what we call kind of produced scarcity, and that is intentionally withholding water uh, for political purposes. And he's made, he's, he has a rather strident view on this, but nonetheless worth, uh, worth looking at, and how water can be used as a weapon, and withholding of water or any resource can be used as a weapon or a means of control. Uh, certainly worth uh, consideration. The control of water uh, has very specific consequences, and I can give you just one or two very quick examples because of time, but one, one very interesting one is certainly uh, what took place in the United States in the mid-19th century when the United States uh, fought the Mexican War, and after winning that war and winning a substantial amount of territory during the 19th century, one of the impacts of, of that war other than the, the territorial gains that the United States made and the, uh, the long-standing enmity it had with its neighbor to the south, were substantial and real changes in the way in which water was used and managed. For example, uh, what we see after uh, the Mexican War is a transfer of land grant, uh, land grant uh, uh, commons to private owners in the United States. So you have water that was controlled uh, commonly uh, and now is being uh, managed and used and owned by uh, private owners or in some cases uh, the U.S. Forest Service. So it goes from one government to another 
and falls into a different category of management. A second issue was a replacing of, of communal acequias uh, uh, with, uh, that were uh, irrigation processes, uh, uh, districts with, with market-oriented um, uh, con conservancy districts. Just the difference in the way the water was managed and to what end uh, determined who got it and who didn't get it. And that was very, very important. And, and the changes in the laws, the changes in the management styles in the United States compared to Mexico uh, made a, a really big difference, uh, most immediately fighting over the Rio Grande River, uh, a perpetual problem between the United States and Mexico, uh, brought to bear these kinds of legal and kind of political uh, situations. A replacement, a replacement on the one hand with subsistence uh, uh, economy by a market economy that was increasingly industrializing meant a different use for the water. And so water that had been possibly abundant enough for some of the, uh, the agricultural uses, maybe in the northern part of Mexico, were now being utilized for very, very different purposes as the country tra transformed its economy. And we can look at broad examples, for example, in the establishment of the, United, uh, of, uh, the Union of South Africa, uh, when we start talking about the, uh, that which forms in, in 19, uh, 1910, the uh, variety of segregationist policies in South Africa that affected who got the water and who didn't as simple as that. So there is this direct correlation in terms of political control that's extremely important. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a, a, a few points uh, uh, to distinguish water from oil, but also to indicate, again, the complexity of, of how we uh, address the problem itself. And the first is looking at, um, looking at the freshwater crisis. In no means do I want to suggest that, that, uh, uh, that we are chicken little and that we're afraid the sky is falling and we're making unfair uh, uh, comparisons with uh, other resources or that we're saying that there isn't a problem. That's not the point at all. It's a question of how we define the crisis and how we utilize ideas of crisis as a way of identifying those issues that we can address and how we can address them in what effective way. Uh, the um, water crisis, freshwater crisis, it's sometimes being compared to the energy crisis, and that to me is uh, simplified on so many levels, I could not even possibly address it, but it is this emphasis that somehow uh, the resource is becoming so unavailable uh, that uh, we're, we're, we're facing the possibility of, of societal changes that we hadn't seen uh, until that point in history. And what we found out about the energy crisis is that it had a specific set of impacts that did not speak generally to access to energy sources, but spoke to geopolitical control of energy uh, and so forth. So crisis uh, is, is a loaded term, and one I've written about in a lot of different contexts uh, that is so easily used and so easily put out there that it tends to, uh, to essentially lose meaning. Uh, biologist and environmentalist uh, Constant Hunt persuasively argued the following. The potential for a global water crisis is the result not of technological incapacity to sustain the global water cycle so much as of the weakness of political will to adopt sustainable technologies. And so, you know, it, th this in no means is, is questioning the good work in science and technology. Indeed, there are so many good ideas. Uh, the question is how does that get into the economic marketplace? How does it get into the kind of political uh, uh, marketplace? Also, I think to take, uh, we need to take account, and we, we talk about the word crisis, is that we don't forget that the, the kind of physical qualities of water as a resource uh, are not resolved. And, and these are debated. Uh, maybe they shouldn't be, but, but they are nonetheless. Let's see if I'm, um, we, th we think about water and whether it is um, an exhaustible resource, whether it is a non-renewable resource, whether it is a renewable resource, it depends who you're talking to. If you're talking to a hydrologist, they're gonna tell you something different than if you're talking to a government official about the availability of water. If you live in a, a country where, that is water poor, uh, then you're gonna see this as an ex exhaustible resource that you're not gonna be able to, re to replace. So it's a, uh, it's a, a, a kind of a tricky uh, and slippery slope and again, the need to, to have some kind of a common language here 
and common agreement before we take a step toward developing a policy becomes rather important. We look at the different ways in which we access water. We think about rivers, we think about a fugitive resource, one that flows and one that's not constant. In this sense, this is probably more comparable to oil uh, than it is to coal or some other, uh, other resource that's in the ground that doesn't move. In the case of oil and, and, and rivers, there is the, the, the common issue of how can you control or utilize that resource and for how long? Uh, because it is not staying in the same place at the same time. Uh, whereas we look at groundwater, we're looking at a uh, common pool uh, a resource, uh, which brings a, a different set of criteria to how do we use it, who uses it, and why. And so when we're talking about crisis, limited su supplies, renewable, non-renewable, we have to kind of identify where that water is located and, uh, and, and how, it's, how it's to be accessed. This issue, uh, water as a commodity, I think is also an extraordinarily important question. And here you see a couple of kind of examples. I, I don't have time to talk about bottled water, but we could do a, a whole day seminar on, uh, on the impact of bottled water on many levels. But I think the crux of the problem here has to do with uh, a fairly current debate that says why we're having so much trouble, why we're having a water crisis is because we've turned water into a commodity and that ultimately uh, water corporatism and privatization uh, play on this kind of, uh, of, of perception of water as a commodity. The only problem with that is that water has normally always been a commodity and it de depends on who controls it. Uh, a, a city government that runs the, the has a water management service that runs uh, the, the water plant obviously sees water as a commodity. Water generates revenue. Revenue is important to the sustaining of the city. The private company that sells water, either as a water peddler or an international water company, obviously sees it in terms of the dollar sign, the euro sign, the pound, what have you. And so uh, to, to put this issue out as if it's a new question, and to assume that we go from a period where water is a, a common resource, a common good, uh, to a period where it becomes a commodity is to kind of bifurcate this debate in ways that is, is utterly unrealistic and not true. So it's really, really important that we kind of understand uh, the uh, kind of historic questions and tensions uh, over the, uh, the way in which water is treated as a resource. And here we get into, uh, again, uh, the, the substantially important issue of culture. Because if we look at India versus the United States, the historic role of water within a religious context, within a economic and political context is very different. And so to come up with a, a global policy that in some way would uh, address questions of shortages without taking into consideration cultural, regional, historic differences uh, is, I think, ultimately uh, uh, to fail. Um, so this kind of typical schism, I think, in some respects, uh, is uh, also needs to be addressing, uh, need to be addressed. And I think that the historical record uh, can be very, very useful uh, in in doing this. One of the uh, maybe positive byproducts of the commodity debate, and it, and it depends, again, who's saying it, is a serious questioning of the economic value of water. And I think the point that's made regularly is that we've undervalued water, uh, we've priced it low in places that does sell water, and the assumption is that this is an abundant resource that is uh, readily available, will continue to be available. We equate the low price, we equate uh, uh, that issue with the assumption that it is very, very abundant, kind of kind of classical economic interpretation of market. Uh, in, the, in the same way, in the United States, we've discussed oil and the low price of oil relative to the rest of the world as something that we've become very used to and therefore we, f we feel we have a right to. Uh, when I moved to Texas in 1971, uh, I was a poor student and I was paying 19 cents a gallon for gasoline and I was horrified when the price went up to 25 cents. Uh, but in, in our country, where, the, where uh, we are used to having resources uh, subsidized and given to us very cheaply, um, this certainly has affected the way in which we uh, develop natural resource policy. And in the case of water, uh, this is also true. And I think many uh, 
uh, professionals and observers who have made the case uh, that uh, the price of water is going to go up and that we're going to see a truer value of water uh, is a very, very important one. The problem with that is that good parts, many parts of the world where access is difficult and where the economies are suppressed and people do not have resources, the question of pricing water at a fair level creates a level of crisis that's, that's well beyond what we might face in the, in the developed world. So uh, even that realization that we do not place an adequate value on water opens up questions of, of, uh, of distinction between uh, certainly one country and another, one place and another. Um, and, and again, part of that debate is a, a rising question, and I'll talk about this briefly in a second, about privatization and water corporatism uh, and how this uh, fits into the whole uh, debate over commodification. I argue uh, in some of the things I've written that we're not talking about commodification of water today, we're talking about re-commodification of water, uh, that the, the debate has changed uh, rather dramatically. Uh, one other, another set of issues with respect to water, providing water and water allocation has to do with, with the so-called crisis in public service. Uh, the idea that our current management practices are such that we are not delivering the water effectively or wasting water uh, or we are faced with uh, questions of reconsidering who indeed uh, controls water from an institutional perspective. On one level, and this certainly is true uh, in the developing world, certainly in the United States, uh, discussions of, of how our decaying infrastructure put in the ground 100 years ago is going to be improved and replaced in such a way so that we're not losing tremendous amounts of water and therefore uh, keep us from having to develop new sources of water and, and so forth and so on. Uh, in other parts of the world where there's not a centralized uh, uh, management process, this question is, is less significant. But one of the issues that rises out of, of the crisis in public service is whether, and this is from a government perspective, whether government should outsource uh, water management or not. Uh, the argument being that the private sector may be able to do it better uh, than, than the uh, government structures themselves. Uh, and another part of that argument is that cities, particularly in the developing world, just do not have resources to place uh, uh, new water infrastructure, so forth, in a high priority. There's so many priorities that cities face, so many uh, reductions in revenue. Uh, in the United States, the, uh, the gap between what had been more generous kind of federal allocation of funds to cities and a period now of, of, of clear austerity and, and, local, uh, and local pressure for uh, uh, taking care of services, that in, indeed cities have to make these difficult choices, and they have. They've outsourced all kinds of different services. The interesting point about water is that of all the services in the city, and water was the first, and oftentimes the most important, it was a revenue generator. And one of the reasons that cities took it on in the beginning was because it was a revenue generator. The public reaction, if you look at the newspapers of the 19th century, what you'll get is city officials saying, the private sector is corrupt, they're not investing uh, enough capital in the development of the infrastructure, therefore we must take it over. And one of the reasons cities wanted to take it over was because it was a revenue generator. And the other was it wanted to protect the public health of the community. Uh, so uh, that argument has kind of been turned on its head in recent years to say that the private sector can do it more efficiently and cities just don't have the capacity. We'll control the resource, but we'll, we'll outsource the management. And certainly this has opened up opportunities for privatization uh, in a big way in the world. Uh, and uh, not so much in, in, uh, in the United States, but other parts of the world. So the question of, of, of uh, a service crisis also is one that tends to have below the surface of it uh, some significant issues that maybe need to be discussed a little bit more thoroughly. Um, okay, and here's just some, some images to go along with that. In the case of privatization, and, and, and I've written a bit about this, it's certainly a big topic and, and, and I don't have time to go into it in great detail, but water as um, an economic profit maker is something that has been well understood for a long time. 
in the United States, uh, uh, certainly we have been in a long era of, of largely public management of our water. But in other parts of the world, that's not true. In France, uh, particularly in Paris, going back at least into the 18th century, private water companies dominated the allocation of water. And those two companies that began in the kind of post-Napoleonic era in France uh, became two of the most important uh, international conglomerates in water that we have today. Uh, Violia Envir uh, uh, Environment being uh, one of the most significant. Uh, there are uh, 10, at least 10 major corporations that, that are essentially responsible for developing uh, water systems throughout the world. Uh, this little chart shows a few. There's a failed one here, and this is only for my kind of uh, Houston relevant audience, which is Enron. Uh, with all the problems that Enron had, and we suffered under those in Houston substantially, they did establish a, a, uh, a company called Azurix uh, to get into the, the water privatization business and it failed. Uh, but they tried, and other, other companies uh, did as well. Others have, have kind of uh, formed together. Some of the bottled water companies, uh, home water system companies, have also been folded in to the international conglomerate. So Calgon is one, Sparkotes is another. Uh, the privatization uh, issue became significant several decades ago. Uh, we see the, the most success in the privatization uh, industry, a uh, water industry, in Western Europe, less successful in Eastern Europe, less successful in uh, Asia and Latin America. In the United States, uh, a little more than 5% of water systems are privatized. Uh, the projections going to 2025 are much larger but uh, so far, the, the trends have stayed that way. Uh, one of the reasons that, that these companies have had access into some parts of the world, especially developing countries, notably in the former Soviet Union, is because uh, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund have sometimes made it a condition of loans that the, the governments of those countries, like Lithuania, Estonia, so forth, uh, bring in private companies to set up their water system, arguing that they need to have a stable infrastructure in order for the, the money to be utilized well. On the surface, that seems to be somewhat reasonable, but it places, places some of the governments in, in, in serious, serious problems where they're, they're lacking control over a lot of their major resources. So privatization has been really dynamic. Um, there have been incidences uh, uh, in South America where the process has been tried, uh, public's responding negatively to it, largely because the price of water skyrockets where income stays stable. So in Bolivia and other parts of Latin America, there have been protests in the streets about rising water prices. So it is a, uh, a result, some people see it as a symptom, uh, of, of a uh, perception of a, of a freshwater crisis that demands alternative solutions, and certainly in the case of these companies, they're trying to sell, sell themselves in that way. Uh, and they've been mightily successful in some parts of the world and, and so far not in, in others. And these are a real, this is a little dated chart on the world water industry, but what's striking about it is the, the revenue uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, selling water has been rather extraordinary. And this, this, I don't particularly like this uh, chart on the left because it seems to indicate that there is this dynamic change in the United States in terms of, uh, of privatization, which is not as great as the, the slide may suggest. And here is in, uh, the, one of the best examples of public protests in Cochabamba, Bolivia, uh, where water prices soared and income remained flat and eventually uh, the privatized system was replaced, uh, but it's been a constant, a constant battle. Uh, another issue, and just to mention, mention very quickly, then to get to conclusions, is that in the mix of, of, of making policy decisions, in the mix of talking about physical freshwater crises, we have to take into consideration that on, um, a, a, on an ethical level, on a more abstract level, the idea of water as a right uh, emerges, certainly in, in UN documents and elsewhere, as an inviolable 
uh, way of looking at uh, a, a, an absolutely essential resource. And uh, th this argument that water is an inherent right that people have uh, certainly uh, complicates the process of developing any kind of a, uh, of a policy uh, that tries to use kind of strict economic uh, arguments or political arguments or even technological arguments to determine uh, how we resolve some of our water issues. And so uh, this runs uh, right in the face of, of, of the kind of, kind of pragmatic concrete issues that cities face. And it's a substantially important question. It gets to the very heart of what do people what do humans have as a, as a basic right for, of survival? Uh, what is something that they, they demand and, and should demand? So this adds a layer of complexity, I think, that is, needs to be addressed. It's not something that you can simply brush aside. It is substantial, it is real, and it's just as real as any of the practical problems that uh, we have discussed. Let me, uh, because of time, let me just kind of jump to a few tentative conclusions, and I'll, then I'll stop. Um, and as I said, I try to muddy the waters a bit. I'm not providing much of a solution, but I, I do think within the policy realm, we oftentimes limit the questions in such a way that the solutions we get tend to be kind of narrow and, and in, in some respects do not lead to any kind of long-lasting resolution. So I do think that uh, the job of, of historians, social scientists, and others is to ask different questions not necessarily to come to different solutions. And in asking those questions, open the debate in some, some degree. Um, there is, of course, a comparison to be made uh, w across resource lines. Comparing water and oil certainly has some comparative value. Uh, like fossil fuels, uh, water has an impact on climate change. And so, and we've already seen earlier this morning, and I think we'll continue to see later on, that the intimacy and the role of water uh, kind of beyond what we consider to be kind of traditional uses is significant and it is global. Uh, in a UN, a UN uh, report stated the following, water is the primary medium through which climate change impacts the Earth's ecosystem and people. Climate change is the fundamental driver of change in the world's water resources and adds additional stress through its effects on other externalities. Also, again, the intimacy between energy and water, uh, as, again, as we've seen earlier today, is, is, is very, very essential. We can't separate them as being kind of separate set of issues. They are connected in effective ways, which always creates additional policy problems, because it depends, again, on what outcomes we are seeking. Are we seeking more energy? And if we seek more energy, what impact does that have on water? If we're trying to protect water sources, what impact does this have on energy generation and so forth? A couple of other things I think that distinguish water uh, from fossil fuels, and others have written about this, so it's certainly not new to me, uh, new from me, is the following. Uh, water is not something that we can substitute. It's not substitutable. It is a resource that stands alone, and we can't find, we might find ways of making more of it growing more water through desalination or other ways, but we can't substitute it in most cases for our uses. In the case of oil, we can substitute it. Whether it's easy to do that or not is another problem, but it can be substituted. Water cannot be in many cases. So this puts it in a very unique category. Uh, water stocks are uh, relatively greater than petroleum stocks, but even in saying that does not mean that they're as easily accessible or that we want to utilize water for um, uh, certain purposes. In the case of, of fossil fuels, uh, maybe a little bit more limited supply, what makes it more problematic in using more oil is well, how would we use it for? Burning it in automobiles or making petrochemicals out of it? There are different sets of issues that come with its uh, availability. Uh, and also water, uh, more than petroleum, has been uh, uh, powerfully tied to the local. Uh, we think about water issues as citizens uh, in terms of how it affects us and certainly how it's managed and controlled often has to do with the variables that relate to kind of local use uh, and access. Uh, it has been very difficult to transport water over great distances. It is bulky in ways that oil is not. 
uh, in terms of uh, its use. You need a tremendous volume of water to accomplish certain tasks. Uh, and so the, the, the relative bulk, the relative difficulty in transport makes it difficult to say, okay, they don't have enough water in this part of Africa, we'll just move it from this part of Asia. It's not that simple, it just doesn't work that way. So uh, water has the, some peculiar uh, uh, physical qualities that make it very, very difficult, uh, very difficult to deal with. Um, also, there is a question of the, the purity of water. In some cases, the absolute purity of water, no matter how we define that, uh, dictates whether it's usable or not. Uh, in some respects, this is distinctive from uh, how we deal with petroleum and the whole refining industry and how it, it comes to us as a, as a consumer. And lastly, the, the question of rights uh, in case of water uh, is distinctive from how we view the case of our right to petroleum. Uh, this is a very, very different set of questions. It rarely comes up in that form within public debate. So in all these ways, it's different and unique. And I do think that uh, as an historian, uh, what we might contribute in some way is again, trying to raise these complexities in order to, to make the dialogue uh, a little bit more complex. And so I've tried to do a little bit of that today. And thank you. Thank you, Martin, for that wide-ranging talk and for the reminder that sometimes we have to go complex before we can arrive at solutions. We have just a few minutes for questions so as not to run too much into the next session or next speaker's time. So uh, as some of you are already demonstrating, there's a mic in the middle. And please keep your questions brief. But above all, please introduce yourself before you ask the question. Thank okay, you. great. Thanks very much. My name is Seth Sheldon. I'm with Energy Points. Um, I was just hoping you could discuss a little bit more um, the effects of uh, varying spatial and, and variations in, in, in um, geography uh, and also spatial scale. Uh, as well as temporal scale when uh, on perceptions of uh, water scarcity. So the two examples I would use are one, you know, we had a picture of the U.S. Things look hunky-dory when you zoom out and average everything, but that may be totally irrelevant for San Diego or places that are sitting above the Ogallala Aquifer or something like that. The other is um, related to temporal scale. Uh, in one year, it may be uh, we may have this idea of water scarcity, and the next we may not. Um, but the long-term kind of decadal sustainability issues um, don't necessarily resonate uh, at a political level or, um, or elsewhere. Yeah, I agree completely with you, and, and because of the lack of time, we could spend a great deal of time talking sure. about it, but I do think that I, oftentimes the way in which the issue is presented to us is presented in this gross way. And if it is, if it is presented to us in that way, then we tend to think about solutions with respect to this kind of universalized view. And, and as you well know, it's very, very difficult to do that. Uh, and some of these issues may apply ac across time and space, but you have to confront uh, uh, these issues first, at the very least, uh, uh, locally. And th that complicates the, the policymaking process uh, because uh, in some cases it, it leaves the responsibility local when the necessary resources to accomplish change are gonna go beyond that local community. So it's, that kind of a cl that classic kind of a problem, and uh, so I, I think the people that, that work in the area understand that completely, mm -hmm. but being presented in this generalized way uh, again tends to mask over uh, those distinctions. And I guess I'll just have to leave it at that. Great, thank you. Uh, David Jackson, uh, Radcliffe Institute. Uh, one reads that uh, water rights. Uh, particularly in this country, in the west and southwestern part of the country, uh, are a um, system that was instituted primarily in the late 19th and early 20th century that uh, really doesn't fit very well uh, in terms of uh, rational water use in today's uh, uh, economy. Could you say something uh, about the issue of water rights and how one might go about effecting a fundamental change from that kind of political scheme to a more rational way of, of um, spreading the access to water? I, I think we're beyond rationality in some cases. 
Uh, yeah, in the United States, we've, we've had traditionally, uh, taking one example, in the East where we are, riparian rights have been really kind of the doctrine that, that dictated uh, water use. You didn't own the water, you, you had rights to the water. In the West, what you have is a complex array of different kinds of laws. Some of it's riparian, some of it is not. And there is a great difference between Utah and California and other places. And again, reconciling historical uh, his, his, historical uh, modes of developing law is very difficult. It's also difficult within the, within the court because you're, you're building a case on, on uh, not on uh, maybe a, a current set of issues, but you're, you're basing on case law that's come from the past. So the difficulty within the courts is going beyond the way in which the, the legal system operates to confront resources. And so, I mean, there have been a, a lot of discussion on how to reconcile the differences in water law. Some of them have made their way in our country to the Supreme Court. Some of them are still being fought locally. So I think I just heard you say it's not fixable. It's not easily fixed. I always like to say it's not easily fixable. So I have a, a modest amount of optimism. Paul Osborne, uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities. Uh, I'll preface my question here by saying I'm not speaking on behalf of the department or the Commonwealth <laughs> when I'm here today. It's required. I have to do it for any public presentation I do. Um, my question is, um, have, um, could you uh, discuss some of the, um, what role uh, water pricing has in um, the uh, ability to obtain uh, resources. Uh, the reason is that uh, the uh, privately owned water systems, and I'm st not speaking about bottled water, the uh, rates are set uh, so that the profit is not from the commodity itself, uh, which makes it rather distinctive from uh, other fuels such as oil, but from the investment that's put in the ground. For example, I could go to the Quabbin Reservoir, put a... Um, a gallon bucket into the reservoir, pull out the water, and that water would have zero value itself. Uh, so have, in your research, have you uh, taken into consideration or any uh, discussion about the, um, that particular difference with uh, water systems versus, uh, say, fossil fuels? Yeah, I, on, uh, I've, done, I've done a lot of work on, on uh, urban water supplies, and, and my understanding and discussion of economics is, is modest. However, mm -hmm. there, there have been amazing sea changes if we're looking specifically in the United States. One of the first was metering. In the 19th century adoption of meters, uh, the assumption was this was a pricing mechanism, a way to, to allow the, the city or whatever, whoever was controlling it, to, to price the, the supply. In many ways, meters are utilized as a way of restraining water use and therefore keeping capital costs down so that cities did not have to go out and find new water sources. So if, if, there, if water is being wasted willy-nilly, then this meant that the city had mm -hmm. to incur high capital costs in getting more access to supplies. In later years, and of course there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms, one that's certainly popular where we live uh, in other parts of the world is combining sewer and water charges together which is somewhat bogus because you're paying a sewage rate based on the absolute amount of water you're using, not on how much water flows out of the house afterwards. But there have been all kinds of efforts, uh, different mechanisms, economic mechanisms, depending upon uh, the physical state of, of the, the city or the, or, the, or the region or the district. Uh, and that's always an, an important factor in being able to either capitalize the continuing growth and development of the system or to, uh, uh, to essentially kind of pay the freight for labor. One of the, the common things I think you see across a lot of utilities uh, in, in the city is the differential charges that take place. For example, if you're, if you're tying in suburban communities into a centralized system, sometimes the suburbs are paying more than the, the inner city folks, and it could be the other way around. The argument is that they have to carry part of the freight for the capital cost. So uh, pricing, is a very, very important tool that has uh, a, a lot of different uses. And so it, within the confines that we're talking about now and the limits of my own expertise, I'd say that that's some initial impression. Yeah, thank you. So this is always disappointing, but I think we have time for just one more question. That's my fault because I went on and talked too long, so. It was worth it. 
Um, I'm June Carolyn Ehrlich. I'm the editor of the of Revista, the Harvard Review of Latin America. Um, when you were talking about Cochabamba uh, and bringing up the issue of privatization and public, that is city or state controlled, um, in Latin America there's been a lot of experimentation with community managed um, water boards. Uh, what do you think is the effectiveness of that? Is it a viable third way? Could you reflect on that? And is there a historical basis for that? Well, uh, my expertise is not deeply into Latin America, although I hang around with a lot of, a lot of American scholars. Um, yeah, I think that what, what it suggests is that there's an effort to find some kind of a middle ground that, is, that keeps control of water in the community. And if there's not a fundamental trust of existing governments or rapid change of government, or if there is a, uh, not a trust of, of, uh, of a private entity, then these alternatives are something that one might consider uh, uh, worth attempting. And I think one of the reasons in Latin America, particularly, why that approach uh, might get some, uh, some, some credit is because of what we, we refer to as kind of the informal uh, delivery of services that exist in parts of, of Latin America, where you have entities, uh, in, in certainly in Brazil, we, we talk about what is essentially suburban Brazil, uh, where you essentially have non-governmental agents that are providing services. And this is not only because government is turning away from that responsibility, but because they almost encourage it as a way of limiting the responsibility of central government. So, so the favelas in, in outside of, of Rio uh, provide services the government doesn't provide. So in that kind of environment where you have a whole range of different ways in which services can be provided, that approach may have some, some credibility. Whether it could be successful or not, I'm not real good at that, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. So we are very lucky to have with us today Charles Tyler. Charles is a reproductive physiologist and ecotoxicologist. He is currently professor of environmental biology at the University of Exeter in the UK. He also serves as the chief scientific advisor for the UK-Japan program in endocrine disruption, disruption, and he will tell you what endocrine disruptors are if you aren't already familiar with that. He was, very, he was one of the very first to discover uh, the existence of hormone-disrupting pollutant activities in the surface waters uh, around the world and that these um, hormonally active pollutants frequently interfere with the sexual development and reproduction capacity of fish. And you should care about fish because um, they are, serve as sensors, very good sensors for all sorts of pollutants and uh, other disruptive activities in our waters. They're sort of like the aquatic canary in the coal mine. He has received several awards in recognition of this important work. Uh, most recently, election as a fellow of the Society of Biologists and the 2012 prize from the Fisheries Society of the British Isles. And today he's going to tell us about his work on environmental contaminants on fish and fish populations and why we should care. Good afternoon. Yes, it is afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And first and foremost, thank you very much to the organizing committee, the ladies along the front, for inviting me to speak here today. And what I want to do today is uh, talk about some work we've been doing for some time now, looking, trying to understand the impacts of this group of chemicals we call endocrine or hormone disrupting chemicals, their impacts on fish and fish populations. And most of the work I'm going to talk about today is done in, uh, in England, and, uh, but the issues in terms of endocrine disruption, of course, apply much more broadly, including to the US, and not just into wildlife, but uh, into humans too, as we'll hear later today. So in terms of the structure of my presentation today, <coughs> I'll first introduce the issue in terms of we really do live in a, a, a contaminated global environment. Then I'll specifically describe what I mean by the term um, endocrine disruption and what endocrine disrupting hormones are. I'll then focus for a large part of the talk on the, the studies we've been doing on the feminization of fish in English rivers, the work that we've done to identify specifically what chemicals are, are causing these disruptive effects, and actually our most current work where we're trying to better understand what the consequences are for populations. 
Unlike for human health, where we care about the impacts on individuals, when it comes to wildlife, people don't seem to care about individuals, it's just about populations. I'll then uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, a new systems we're trying to develop to better understand how these chemicals work in the bodies um, of fish, new, if you like, more intelligent system to help us direct where these uh, problems might be within the bodies of fish. And then I'll very briefly address the issue, can we fix the problem of these chemicals in wastewater? The answer is yes, it's just what we're willing to pay. And then a few uh, final concluding thoughts. Well, we just have to look at satellite imagery to, to realise, that, and, and it gives some real powerful insights into the extent of our chemical influence on the planet. And we can do this anywhere around the globe and see examples of this. And here we have uh, the forest fires in Australia, uh, which were uh, started deliberately some, year, deliberately some years ago and uh, spewing out uh, things like dioxins and furins. We have an example here of the Middle East when Saddam Hussein had a short sortie into Kuwait before he was chased back out again, back into Iraq. And as he did so, he set on fire all these um, oil wells. And you can see th hundreds of thousands of tons of oil spilling out into the Gulf, into the fresh water and the marine environments. And then you can look from satellite imagery on a more global perspective and look at things like carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide concentrations here and see concentrations of these around specific regions of the globe, around areas where we're slashing and burning to create grazing ground, high levels of industrial activity, and in the, the nor northern uh, sort of, uh, uh, regions in domestic use where we're burning fossil fuels to keep us warm during the winter. So we can just look at satellite imagery and, and start to realise the level and extent of our chemical influence on the planet. Now, when we think about the environmental compartments, the aquatic environments really do act as, as the sink for most pollutants that we put out there in the environment. We use about 80,000 or so chemicals in products. It's about $3 trillion uh, global enterprise. We use about 10 to 20,000 in very, very regular use. And these are very diverse and different in nature. They include pesticides, fertilizers, of course, plasticizers, and, of course, pharmaceuticals, uh, drugs to, to treat our own health. Most of these compounds, most of these uh, chemicals enter our freshwater systems through wastewater treatment works and or via surface runoff. And you have to be very careful, I think, when you use uh, statistics. But these are a couple of statistics that I, I pulled out uh, from the literature and to give you some idea of the magnitude of the amount of waste that we're producing and discharging into the environment. And I find it quite hard to get my head around these sort of um, uh, uh, dimensions. Uh, we use about, uh, or discharge about 450 cubic kilometres of waste waters into our rivers, lakes and stream on an annual basis. And then we require about another 6,000 cubic kilometres of waste water to dilute and transport those wastes before they can be used again. And this equates to a very large proportion of the, of the, of the world's total freshwater runoff. And if we think about these statistics, combined with things like increasing demand for fresh waters, we've heard from some of our presentations today, in the UK, I think it's increasing about 2% year on year. And things like climate change too, when the supply of fresh waters are going to become probably less predictable, then clearly this is going to place greater pressures on the organisms living in aquatic environments and, of course, associated with aquatic environments. So what pollutants should we be concerned of? Well, there are lots of chemicals, of course, that we discharge we now know are toxic and, and problematic to wildlife and to human health too. In Europe, we have a list of 33 so-called priority substances, priority hazardous substance, and at the moment, another 15 are being considered for um, addition to that list. And these new additions include further plant protection products and biocidal products. They include various industrial chemicals, and for the first time ever, they also include pharmaceutical substances. And they include 17 alpha ethanol estradiol, that's the uh, uh, estrogen used in the contraceptive pill. They also include estradiol, which is also used for, for, for in terms of contraception. And they also include diclofenac, which is an anti-inflammatory, which probably many people in the audience have taken that at, at some times. You can get it by over the counter now. And that compound has been shown to be responsible for actually collapse in vulture populations in parts of Asia. The pharmaceutical industry is a massive industry, of course, it's an $800 billion industry. And of course, the very difference with pharmaceuticals compared to some of these other chemicals which have these unintended side effects in the bodies of animals is, in fact, they're specifically designed to alter processes in the bodies of, of humans. And because many of those processes are conserved, it means that wildlife is exposed are also going to be subject to those changes, those changes in their physiology, if they're exposed to high enough concentrations. 
Now, these aren't just the chemicals that we should be uh, concerned about. There are whole others around at the moment which are fairly interesting in terms of there's a lot of research going on, um, and they, they're things called PFOAs, so perfluoric octanoid acids. These are actually found in the blood of probably of every individual that's sitting in the audience here today. And there's some data coming together now indicating that elevated levels related to increased cholesterol and things like chronic kidney disease too. There are things we use as flame retardants, which are used in many, many of the products, including the seats that we're probably sitting on now. These are associated with alterations the way the thyroid system works. And bisphenol A, which we'll hear, I'm sure, a lot more about this afternoon from much more informed lady than me in it, with respect to this compound. And uh, this has been now associated with some health disorders, including in humans, things like obesity and, and reproduction. And the reason part for listing those chemicals, it's a long list, is that many of these chemicals are what we now term hormone disrupting chemicals or endocrine disrupting chemicals. I'm very conscious I have a very mixed audience here today. So it, what are hormone disrupting chemicals? What are endocrine disrupting chemicals? Well, if we think of the way that our bodies work, and it's very similar way in which the bodies of other vertebrates, wildlife species work as well, there are two major sort of communication systems within the body. The first, of course, is the nervous system. This is where we have a series of uh, coded or digitized information that comes from receptors to the integrating centers like the spinal cord and the brain. That makes some sense of that incoming information and then relays uh, further nerve impulses, uh, further digital information to effector organs, and we take our response. It's a fast acting system. It's digitized. It's somewhat like a telephone network system. The endocrine or the hormone system it is somewhat different in nature in the sense that there are a series of glands located around the body and they produce hormones. These are released into the blood, generally released into the blood. They pass to their point of reception and there they bind to a specific element called a receptor and that in, then instructs a specific response in that tissue. So the endocrine system is a bit more like a postal system and uh, essentially it's at slower acting but it tends to be, have greater longevity. The effects ensuing from these um, hormones tend to be longer lasting. So what is an endocrine or a hormone disrupting chemical? Well, it, it, it can, it's a chemical, it can be man-made or natural and what it does, it mimics or disrupts the hormone system. So it can alter things like growth, development and or reproduction. And it doesn't necessarily instruct and do that response in the individual that's exposed. It can mediate that effect in the subsequent offspring or the progeny from that exposed individual. And there's lots of ways now in which these hormone disrupting chemicals can work. The first, it can be structurally similar to one of our own natural body hormones. It comes along and it binds to that receptor and then it instructs that response. So it acts as what we taught, term a hormone receptor agonist. It's stimulating a hormonal response. There are other chemicals which act as hormone receptor antagonists. That is to say that they're structurally very similar to the hormones in our bodies. They come along, they bind to receptor, but they're not quite right. They don't allow us things like a conformational change to allow that complex to bind to the DNA and instruct that hormone response. So what they do, they bind to receptor, but they block it. They don't let the native hormone get access to it. So they act as what we term a hormone receptor antagonist. And as research has gone on over, over on hormone disrupting chemicals the last two decades, we're finding all sorts of other ways in which these chemicals can interfere with the hormones in our body. They can affect the enzyme systems that create these hormones, turn them over, and or excrete them. So hormone or endocrine disrupting chemicals can act in lots of different ways in our bodies or in the bodies of wildlife to change the balance of hormones within our systems. Now, there's lots of studies now from wildlife species, including in the US, which have strong associations between specific or some of the classes of endocrine disrupting chemicals and abnorm abnormal development, particularly abnormalities in terms of reproduction. There's evidence, for example, of exposure to some of these chemicals can alter developmental processes in amphibians. To, we see these um, Frankenstein frogs coming out with extra limbs. There's evidence that exposure to some pesticides and dicofol and their, and their metabolites can alter things like reproductive development in alligators, the extensive studies in places like Florida by, by people like Lou Gillette and others. And there's also evidence for disruption in birds in relation to behaviors, sexual behaviors, some really extensive studies done in the States some time ago now, and some also some very exciting studies coming out from parts of Europe now, where some of these chemicals are shown to alter the way the brain develops. So in fact, they affect things subsequently like song pattern in birds. And if you're a drab looking bird like this nightingale here, song is everything if you're a male to maintain your reproductive prowess. 
Not only is there evidence for uh, effects of these chemicals on wildlife, there's also uh, effects, uh, uh, evidence for effects of these chemicals or links with these chemicals with, with human disorders too, particularly in relation to, to reproduction. There are linkages with falling sperm counts, of course, increase in hormone dependent, dependent cancers. And I'm sure many, if not most of you, have heard about these studies, within, uh, particularly within the US, but some in Europe too. Our venture into endocrine disruption actually started uh, about 20 years ago, and uh, I was working at Brunel University with some colleagues there with the Centre for the Environment, of Fisheries and Aquaculture uh, Sciences Division, and uh, at that time we established that fish that were placed in rivers, in English rivers, in effluent discharges, in wastewater treatment work discharges, male fish unusually produced yolk protein in their plasma, in their blood. Now that yolk protein is called vitlogenin, and these fish were just exposed for a three week period, it was rainbow trout that were exposed, and the amount of this yolk protein produced by these fish was quite astonishing. In fact, when I actually uh, got the data off from the counter, my supervisor at the time, John Sumter, didn't believe it and asked me to go back and reanalyze the data. In fact, we saw up to a million-fold induction of that female protein at these fish that were placed at these different wastewater treatment works. And this study was done across around about 20 sites in England. So that established that effluence from wastewater treatment works, in England at least, had this uh, widespread estrogenic activity, this widespread estrogenic nature. And we knew it was estrogens or region-like compounds because that yolk protein produced in the males is normally only produced in females because it serves to go into the eggs. It's a similar thing you see in your chicken egg. Um, and it's dependent on estrogens. The concern wasn't quite so much that males could produce this female yolk protein. It was more that we know in fish unlike in mammals, that sexual development is quite plastic. It's fairly easy to change sexual development within fish species. So you can take a genetic male and you can expose it to high amounts of estrogen, the female hormone estrogen, you can actually produce a female. You can make that male, rather than producing a testis, it produces an ovary. Likewise, if you take a genetic female and you expose it to high concentrations of androgens, you can produce a male, you can produce a testis in that fish. Now, if you take intermediate doses or concentrations of those uh, steroid estrogens or androgens, you can produce a condition called intersex, where you have both male and female sex cells contained within the same gonad. So in some cases, it's developing eggs. Here we see some developing eggs inside the testis. In other cases, this is a male testis with an ovarian cavity. So we know that if you expose males to estrogens, we can, in, or females to androgens, you can induce disruptions in sexual development. And then we spend about a decade or so studying wild fish populations in English rivers receiving, in some cases, quite high levels of effluent discharges to see whether we could find evidence for sexual disruption in the native fish species. And the species we chose was called the roach. It's a member of the carp family. And that was chosen because there are many of them found throughout lowland uh, England. And we were quite surprised in relation to the level and degree of the incidence that we saw in the wild fish population. So at uh, of the 51 sites study at 44 of those sites we found male fish that had these feminized characters they had oocytes in the testis and or they had an ovarian cavity and the degree and level of disruption varied across the different sites that we studied but at some sites all the male fish were feminized to a greater or lesser extent now, it's very difficult to assign a phenotype, an effect that you see in a wildlife population or a disease state um, with any particular environmental factor. Environments, by their very nature, are complex. And so we, we then spent about another decade of research doing controlled exposures of our roach to uh, real wastewater treatment effluents at varying concentrations at various sites around the country to see if we could induce the feminized responses that we saw in our male fish. And in fact, we could choose every feminized response that we could see in, the, uh, in, in our wild fish. We could induce that yolk protein, we could induce ovarian cavity formation, and we could also induce, induce true intersex, the presence of developing eggs within the testis of male fish.
Now, the concentrations of efferents required to induce these phenotypes, to in, uh, induce these effects varies, vary, but they are all within the confines and, and the, the concentrations, the amount of effluents that we find in English rivers. Many of our uh, ri rivers in England are quite small, and that, what that means is that quite a lot of the flow of the rivers can be made up of effluents from wastewater treatment works. In fact, if you look at this map here, this map of England and Wales is showing the concentration, the level of dilution of uh, uh, effluents in our English rivers. And the red spots indicate whether there's a one in one or less than one in one dilution. So 50% of the flow at the river at these sites is comprised of effluent from wastewater treatment works. And if we look on a, a seasonal basis in some of our rivers, during the summer, of course, we have lower levels. It doesn't always rain in England, as sometimes people think. During the summer, we often, not this year, but often we tend to have a low rainfall. And what that means is the effluent that uh, gets more concentrated within our rivers. And some, in some instances, in some rivers, you can see 60, 70, 80, even 90% of the flow during the summer months can be made up of effluent from wastewater treatment works. So these effects that we induce by these control exposure represent real world world scenarios. Now the next, the next big question was who done it and this is a fairly complex slide for which I apologise but it, uh, it, it actually captures the whole process in terms of exposure to identifying what chemicals are involved with this process. So the next challenge really was trying to identify well, what are these chemicals in the effluents which are leading to causing these feminised responses in male fish and actually lots of groups undertook this, undertook this type of work. Many focused on to trying to find out what oestrogens were present in effluent. Our approach was somewhat different with Liz Hill at University of Sussex and what we focused on was trying to find out what chemicals were taken up into the fish and what concentrated in the fish, because that really matters and in terms of and potentially inducing these feminized responses. So we took our roach and we placed them in real-world effluents, and then we used, you could use various tissues. We used the bile as the concentrating medium because it's a rather useful tissue to access because it's a good uh, uh, center for concentrating the chemicals before many are subsequently discharged uh, from the fish. We took that bile, and what Liz did was she she fractionated, she separated that bile out by a technique called HPLC, it doesn't matter, she just fractionated out the bile out into its component parts, and then each one of those fractions was screened, was tested, to see whether there's any estrogen activity in, uh, contained within the fractions. And this was done by a very clever, recombinant little yeast system here, and what, it, what we have within the yeast, it has the estrogen receptor, human estrogen receptor in there, such that if that fraction had estrogen-like activity, it would bind to that estrogen receptor, switch on a cascade of events, and in turn, turn uh, change the chromogenic substance from a yellow to a red. So we could just use this yeast screen to say, well, are there any estrogens? If so, where are they within that fractionated profile? Having identified the so-called hot fractions, then Liz went on and used various other analytical techniques like GCMS and LCMS to identify what those chemicals were. And actually, there's a whole sea of estrogens that these fish suck up into their bodies. And these are just some of them here. We have natural steroid estrogens like estro and estradiol, and they emanate from, well, largely women sitting in the audience, well, just the women sitting in the audience, but women generally. Um, we have ethanol estradiol, which is uh, derived from the contraceptive pill, of course. We found this one here, this is dihydroequilenin. We found equilenin too. These are horse estrogens, equine estrogens, and they're purified from the urine of pregnant mares, pregnant horses. They're then concentrated up, put into hormone replacement therapy, which then uh, uh, ladies take during the menopause, and then eventually if somebody's find their way back into the waters, in our case, back into the fish. And a whole series of industrial products too. Surfactants like non-alphenol, it's polyethoxylates. We sometimes found bisphenols and phthalates too. The take home here was lots of estrogens get taken up into the fish and get concentrated within the fish. And the feminized responses that we're seeing in male fish in English rivers probably relate to this chemical cocktail of estrogens. Having said that, <coughs> there's some key players. Some of the chemicals which these fish are concentrated are exquisitely potent. Ethanol estradiol, for example. Ladies take it for contraception because it is so potent. It's so effective in what it does. And it's very effective in feminizing fish too. So what we've done is we take ethanol estradiol, we've taken our environmental sentinel, the roach, we've done lab-based exposures, including for up to over two years, to look to see whether we can induce the responses that we see in our fish, the feminized responses, 
um, with real-world um, exposure concentrations. And indeed, we can. We can induce ovarian cavity formation, vitrogenin synthesis, so yolk protein production, and also true intersects, the presence of oocytes within the testis of male fish. In fact, some work we published fairly recently where we did a two-year exposure of our roach from, from essentially from embryos to sexual maturity to ethanol estradiol, we caused a complete sex reversal of the whole population. All the population were female for an exposure to four nanograms per litre ethanol estradiol. Now, that's higher than we find in the environment. You might find that level in some of the most polluted effluents, but that's higher. But it just illustrates the principle of the plasticity of sexual development fish, and so, therefore, their vulnerability to some of these chemicals. Now... Estrogens, I think, is a big part, and in fact, I'm very convinced it's a big part in terms of players in relation to feminizing fish in the English rivers, but it might not be the be-all and end-all. Um, some work done a few years ago where we were screening efferents throughout the UK, and as has been done in the US as well, there's widespread anti-androgenic activity found too. So these are chemicals which will, rather than stimulate the estrogen axis, they block the androgen axis. And so this is widespread throughout the UK too, and we're using a very similar sort of foren forensic approach to try and identify what these estrogens are. And we're getting somewhere, again, his work with Liz Hill at the University of Sussex. We found about a half a dozen already, but none so far are anywhere near as potent as the steroid estrogens. Okay, so we know that effluents are estrogenic around the country. We know that wild fish are being impacted. We even got a good handle in respect to what chemicals are actually causing uh, these effects. The big question now, well, does it matter? Does it really matter that these fish are feminized to a greater or lesser extent? And we've addressed it on, uh, this on two levels. The first is to say, well, does it impact on the ability of indiv fish, individual fish to breed? And the second question, does it matter from a population perspective? So these are fairly, fairly, some fairly old data now, but they just illustrate the point. So if you take intersex fish from the wild, you strip the sperm from them, and you place that sperm on the eggs of good quality females, some eggs from, from females from clean sites, you can look at the ability of that sperm to, to fertilize the eggs. And when we do this, indicated here, so here's the proportion of offsprings which were success, successfully hatched from this fertilization. Here's a normal male. Then these fish are males with increasing degree of feminization. So this is mildly affected and this is adverse, uh, very strongly feminized. And you can see this relationship. So to the individual, yes, it does matter in terms of they produce sperm of lower quality. In fact, we've done a whole series of other studies looking at the bit how well that sperm swims from those fish. So just like would happen in a human fertility clinic, they'll take sperm from a, from, from a gentleman and they'll look at the volume, they'll look at things like the motility, how well it swims and how, how long it swims for using something called computer-assisted sperm tracking. We've done the same thing for fish and we find this is much reduced in these intersex fish. So if you're an individual intersex fish, it does matter in terms of your sexual prowess. Now, that's a very false scenario in terms for the individual fish because you're taking the sperm from that fish and you're placing on the eggs of uh, females, a good quality eggs from, from a female from a clean site. But, of course, in reality, in the wild, that's not going to be the position. In the wild, males are going to be competing with one another for access to the female to try and fertilize the eggs as she's spawning. So we've attempted to address the issue, look at um, how well these intersex fish uh, can uh, perform in terms of reproductive capability, looking at this more realistic uh, simulated um, scenario. And what we've done here, we've collected fish from, in this case is from the River Arran, where we know there's both normal males, normal females, and some intersex fish. We've brought those fish back into the laboratory um, near the time of spawning, and we placed these fish in breeding tanks. This was 13 replicate tanks, and each one in, in each one of those tanks, we have three females and, and six males. Now, six males, because that creates some competition between those males. And when I say males, some of these are going to be intersex fish. We, uh, we then allow those fish to breed, then what we've done is we've uh, developed something called DNA microsatellites. These are genetic probes that enable us to identify the individual adult fish in those breeding tanks, but also they enable us to identify the offspring and which one is their mum and which one is their dad. So we developed these DNA microsatellites so we can match the offspring produced back to the adults which are breeding within these tanks. 
Then our colleagues at um, Brunel University have, have taken the gonads from these adult fish after they spawn, and they've looked to say, are they normal males, are they normal females, or indeed are they intersex? Are they disrupted in terms of uh, their sexual development? And they've developed something called an intersex index, and that's simply a measure of, really, of how many oocytes are contained within the testes of the male fish. And it runs from zero to seven, so zero is a normal male, and a severely feminized male would be an index of of four or five. And really, to cut a, a long story pretty short, short given time, this is the data that, we, that we've got from that study. So here we're looking at the reproductive uh, performance, success of the individual fish uh, dispersed amongst those tanks. And across the bottom here, we have the degree and measure of feminization, the intersex index. So these fish here are moderate, these are moderately uh, intersex, and these are severely intersex fish. And you can see this relationship. So in fact, under these realistic simulated uh, breeding scenarios, again, it does matter if you're intersex, certainly if you're moderately to severely intersex, you have a reduced breeding capability. And in fact, for every uh, increment in one in terms of the intersex index, you have a 15% reduction in your breeding capability. So that's where we are really in terms of our, st our story in relation to uh, sexual disruption in, in roach in UK rivers. It certainly matters uh, to individuals in terms of their ability to contribute to the next generation. The next big question, the holy grail in relation to really to envi environmental risk assessment, whether it's fish or other forms of wildlife, is does it matter to the population? These are, these are really challenging questions for us to try and address. And one way we're starting to try and address that for our studies on roach in English rivers is to try try and see whether fish living in the more polluted estrogenic environments are changed in terms of their genetic and structure and function, if you like, of those populations. We're looking to see if there's a reduced number of individuals which are actually breeding within those populations because that's what our lab-based studies would sort of indicate. We're doing this study around the southeast of England because the southeast of England has very good roach populations. They've been studied for many years. There's very good data in relation to the amount of estrogens uh, contained within these uh, rivers and the effluents discharging into these catchment system. And we've done this study now. We're just in the process of completing it now. So these data are fairly hot off the press and, and, and please take them with, with a note of caution. We've done it across 37 sites. It's been a three-year study. And again, we've used these DNA microsatellites to look at to some extent, the genetic variation within the populations that we're studying. And as I say, this is very, very preliminary data, but essentially here we're looking at the size of the breeding population, and here is the amount of estrogen contained in, the, in those rivers. And there certainly appears, tentatively at this point, to be a relationship between, if they're in the more estrogenic rivers, there's a smaller cohort of individuals that are breeding within those populations. Now, if this transpires to be true, this is a very, very significant finding, thinking about population-level impacts and implications of endocrine-disrupting chemicals. To move very quickly now to the last sort of chapter, if you like, in relation to this work on endocrine disrupting chemicals, nearly all of our work has been focused on the effects of these chemicals on fish and on breeding and breeding capability. Um, but of course, estrogens play a much wider role in relation to animal health, our own human health as well as wildlife health too. Um, Evidence is starting to come from studies on... It's probably, it's probably the case that every cell in your body has an estrogen receptor of some subtype on it, giving you some idea of the potential involvement in various uh, uh, physiological processes. And there's starting to evidence to come from studies on human health in particular, but studies on, on, on rodents contained in the laboratory that... that that some of these estrogens can induce wider health effects from everything from things like uh, uh, obesity, for example, to alter patterns in, in development. And so what we've done recently is we've been trying to develop, if you like, more intelligent models. I don't know if that's the science or arrogant. We're trying to develop more effective model systems to help us understand where these estrogens are working in the body. So we've developed something called a transgenic fish. And these transgenic fish are specifically designed to look at where estrogens, those chemicals of concern, work in the bodies of the fish. So this is in the zebra fish. And essentially what we've done, we've created some genetic constructs which actually go and get incorporated essentially into the genome of the fish, such that if you then expose that fish to environmental estrogens, they glow green in the target tissues which are being affected by those compounds, by those chemicals. This has just very recently been published. And so what we're able to do now, we were able to do this whole body profiling with a little, little baby uh, zebrafish, essentially, to work out where these different estrogens are acting in the body. 
how, to what extent they differ between different types of environmental estrogens, and in turn better uh, process and target our studies on potential health, associated health effects of exposure to environmental estrogens. And this one just, the top one is a control fish, and here we have a fish exposed to ethanol estradiol, and here we have a fish exposed to bisphenol A. Now these don't equate in terms of concentrations. This is a much higher exposure concentration to this compound bisphenol A compared to ethanol estradiol. It's just illustrating that they provide these different body profiling of exposures to different estrogens. And already, and very, very briefly and very, very excitingly, um, we found, for example, well, for bisphenol A, which we don't find for exposure to sterile estrogens, the heart comes up. So we get green glowing in the heart. And this is a fish heart, and the heart is actually stained here in red to show you the heart. And this green is indicating where bisphenol A is having an effect in the heart of the fish. And it's not in the myocardium, as we might have thought. It's actually acting in and around the valve system. So it's just an indication how these, these fish might be able to better, help us better target where to look for health effects of specific environmental chemicals. And we're trying now, we've been funded recently to develop this, this type of system for androgens, to look at androgens in the body. And we'd like, also like to do glutocorticoids. Okay, so finishing off now. The issue is, can we really fix a problem in relation to endocrine disrupting chemicals in effluent discharges? And this work and other things too have driven in the UK something called the UK Endocrine Disruption Demonstration Programme. This is a £40 million investment just to look at the various technologies which are available in terms of their efficacy in removing particularly steroidal estrogens from these effluent discharges. And there have been a number of uh, concerted and focused studies now looking at some of the advanced treatment te uh, uh, technologies like, for example, activated carbon, but also things like ozonation and chlorine dioxide. And I'm not going to go into the details now, but the take-home is they're pretty effective. They'll strip out most, in some cases, all of these estrogenic compounds from the effluent discharges. And one interesting thing from that study that's come through is that it doesn't necessarily have to be these advanced treatment technologies to better enable and, and help remove these compounds. What was also found with some fairly basic sort of technologies like more efficient, effective sand filters, for example, and uh, more effective uh, um, hydraulic retention times, the time that those influences are, are held and processed within wastewater treatment works, that also was very effective in removing some of these EDC. In the UK, I'm not sure if it's, if it's a parallel in the US, but in the UK, many of our sewage treatment works, our wastewater treatment works, are under huge pressure, basically, in terms of the load that they receive. So perhaps they're not efficient as effective as in some cases as they might be. And really uptake, of course, of which these treatment technologies to remove the ED EDCs will depend on partly the desire to do so, but also balanced against the energy cost. Of course, as we mentioned today, essentially, there's going to be an increased carbon cost if we put things like activated carbon and ozonation and chlorine into the equation. So to finish with now, just a few concluding thoughts. Um, there's no doubt fish and some of the wild forms of wildlife are pretty susceptible to some of these hormone-disrupting chemicals. And I think, certainly in relation to fish, sexual de uh, development is particularly plastic, is particularly uh, able to be disrupted by these chemicals. So, so we mustn't assume, when we do tests on mice and rats to protect human health, that's necessarily going to provide us a, a good guideline in terms of protection of wildlife health. Some of the studies that we've done us for the last four or five years in particular, where we've been exposing for up to two, three, and even four years to some of these chemicals, is that longevity of exposure is really important. The longer you expose, quite often it's the case that the lower the effective concentration to induce some of these responses. And so, you know, we have to consider, as is happening in terms of human health, some more longitudinal studies. What's the lifetime exposure impact? Certainly in the case of fish living in English rivers, intersex does affect their condition for individuals to breed. And we've just got some tentative data now to indicate there may be some effects in terms of the genetics of some of, our, some, some of our wild fish populations. I suppose a major question for endocrine disruption when we think about wildlife, but for other chemical insults in our wildlife too, is what are the fitness costs uh, first of all, can these organisms adapt over time? And if they can to these chemicals, what are the fitness costs? What are the implications for sustainability of these populations? And indeed, you know, what's their resilience, essentially? If we go on, because it, without doubt, in this increasing world, we're going to have an increasing levels of contamination. So we need to better understand what the resilience of these wildlife populations are. And I hope I've also illustrated to you that there's some really fabulous and exciting molecular tools and technologies out there which are coming to fore now, which are certainly helping us to better inform how these chemicals work in the bodies, in our case, in fish and wildlife, but in, for, for studies on humans too.
So just to finish, just to acknowledge there's been a lot of people who have funded and supported this work um, over the years and a lot of great collaborators. It's been a really uh, joint effort and a really enjoyable bit of research to do, I have to say, albeit has some environmental concern. And thank you very much for being patient and listening. Thank you, Charles. That was fabulous. Um, let me start off the questions by um, reminding people that it is the 50th anniversary of the publication of Rachel, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, and one of the things that she um, relayed in that book was the discovery, the nascent discovery that the pesticide DDT could also act as an estrogen mimic. We now know that um, one quarter of all the pesticides tested, although they were designed to affect one physiological system or set of molecules, can also mimic estrogen. So did you find evidence of pesticides being taken up by the fish as well in your analysis? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, the difficulty to some extent is when you do these scans and you do these screens, when you're looking at, uh, if you like, a, a holistic analysis in terms of what chemicals are contained within those fractionated, uh, those fractions in relation to, to the HPLC separations, is you tend to pick out the most potent ones, most potent fractions. So you tend to pick out the steroidal estrogens and, and the equine estrogens, uh, non-alphenol and some the, sometimes the salates and, and the plasticizers too. Um, we have picked up a whole series of pesticides um, within, the, with, uh, within these exposed fish. Sometimes they're there at a, a concentration a thousand fold higher than uh, actually in the effluent discharges, but they're pretty weak compared to those other commercials in terms of being estrogens. Nicole Acevedo, uh, Tufts School of Medicine. I was wondering if you have looked at transgenerational effects mm -hmm. in, in your controlled wild roach population specifically on, on reproductive function? Yeah, really good question. Um, the answer is yes, uh, in relation to studies on, on zebrafish. Um, it's very difficult to do transgenerational studies on things like roach because they take, uh, the females take three years to mature, so any transgenerational study will by very nature is a five year, uh, five, six year study. But we've done these studies in zebrafish and you get um, effects on uh, environmentally relevant concentrations, you get effects uh, enhanced effects on the F1 generation compared to the F0 uh, generation in terms of uh, reduced sperm quality is one example, for example. We haven't done those studies um, in terms of reproductive capability on roach, our sentinel species, but what we have done is we've exposed roach throughout their lives to an estrogenic effluent, then looked at the relative responsiveness to estrogens in those fish in terms of, you know, how easily are they stimulated. And interestingly, and again, we haven't published these data yet, is that there seems to be a suppression in terms of responses to estrogens in some of those fish. So it looks like there may be some, and it may be epigenetics, I don't know, basically. It looks to be some sort of suppression in terms of their responsiveness. Hi, Sarah Elizan from Columbia University School of Public Health. Uh, you mentioned that endocrine disruptors um, have a potential for causing obesity in humans. Did you look at um, the different weights between fish that have endocrine disruptors or fat percentages at all to see if that was the case in fish as well? Good question. Yeah, really good. No, we didn't. I, I need to do that. <laughs> Great. Actually, fat is deposited somewhat differently in fish than it is compared to, to, to in humans or in okay. mammalian systems. They don't have a sort of an uh, adipose system as we do. They tend to lay it down in sort of like you know, layers of fat inside, the, around the viscera, essentially. So it might be a somewhat more tricky thing to do, but it's, it's a good question. No, I haven't, I haven't okay. thought of that. <laughs> do it. <laughs> uh, thank you for, for your presentation. Don Krenz with the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, I noticed that one of your colleagues at a different university did a study on the Thames, I believe in Soar River, where they found a 20 to 30 fold increase in, these, in estradiol and estrone uh, in the rivers during the summer months. And my question is, is there a, is there a, a dose response, a linear response, or is there a threshold effect of these chemicals? And since the fish can't leave and go to France in the summer, they're uh, disproportionately affected during the summer months, and I'm just curious about that. Again, a really good question. Yeah, you're probably referring to Richard Williams or Andrew Johnson's work. We've done a lot of work in terms of modeling estrogenic concentrations in around the, the southeast, around, around the Thames regions, and you're right. You know, the concentration of estrogen can vary uh, very considerably during the summer months, getting to 
for pretty high, pretty high levels. And interesting, in that period is when it's probably going to be most, uh, fish are going to be most susceptible to disruption of sexual function because the roach, for example, spawn in about May time, April, May time. And so they're going through sexual development, sexual differentiation when potentially estrogenic concentrations are at their highest. I suppose it really in terms of um, thinking about how does that translate into to phenotypes effects. Well, for sexual disruption, it'll be a period when it's most vulnerable. For things like vitlogen induction, for example, that protein production, uh, that's a transient uh, induction, for example. So it'll go up, and if you remove or reduce estrogen stimulation, then it'll go down. And in relation to the specifics, in relation to is it a threshold response or is it a concentration-related response, in relation to things like some of the biomarkers like vitalgen, it's a concentration-related effect. For things like um, sexual differentiation, it's a threshold, basically. And for things like sexual differentiation, it's probably the case that once you reach that threshold, if it's during a period of sexual differentiation, then you actually you maintain that phenotype. You have that effect for or however long subsequently. Thank you. Life, possibly. Ron Swarig from Woods Hole. Um, uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. In terms of mitigation aspects, I'm wondering if any work is being done with regard to looking at dry, dry toilets or composting toilets and the impact on breaking down some of these things, in addition to water conserving elements to those and potential uh, nutrient con uh, uh, conservation. Uh, has any studies been done to look at the breakdown of these, of these endocrine disruptors uh, through the composting process? Good question, and I personally don't, I don't know of any, any studies ongoing, I'm, there must be some going on somewhere, probably just my ignorance here, but I don't know of any to be honest with you. But I think it's a, you know, a good question, well pointed.